So, you did become a cowboy, right, Mr. Cargill? That's exactly correct. All right, that's about seven, seven and a half. That's fine, so we just sit here like this and talk. All right. And we're in the office of Mr. O.A. Cargill, uh, here in the uh, Hales Building in downtown Oklahoma City. Uh, this is the 12th day of February, 1965. And this is a portion of the Living Legend Library at Oklahoma Christian College which, as you know, Mr. Cargo, will be used as a basis of research, of history, of student workshop, and so forth. So uh, rather than being formal, we're sort of informal about this. We go right along with just an ordinary conversation. But we think it will be of, uh, and I know the college thinks it will be of historical record, be one of the first ones I know in the state, and perhaps one of the few in the country. Mr. Cargo, you just, you look like a million dollars today. <laughs> Maybe I look all right, but then I've held up pretty well for a man of my age. And your age is what at the present time? I'm 80 years old. When's your birthday, sir? 26th of February this year. I'm born February the 26th, 1885. And as we were just talking uh, prior to turning on the equipment, you had a nice uh, brisk ride this morning on your horse. I, did. I ride a horse every morning four miles. Mr. Cargill, let's go back a little bit. Uh, I'm sure that you can reminisce when you first came to Oklahoma City and also I know there's a very good reason why. Well I came to Oklahoma Territory uh -huh. before I came to Oklahoma City to live. I came into the Indian Territory where the town of Bristow now is before the town was built uh -huh. uh, and uh, worked not near Bristow and uh, at uh, the place called the Pew which is just this side of Bristol, before those towns were built. Where'd you come from? Came from Arkansas. My father was a minister and also an MD. And he was training me for the ministry and put me in Mountain Home Baptist College out here where the Mountain Home, uh, well, we refer to it as a Norfolk Dam, I believe, Mountain Home, Arkansas, where the Bull Shoals Lake said in the Norfolk. One of those lakes covers the old farm in which I was raised on. Mm -hmm. And uh, I decided I wanted to come to Oklahoma and be a cowboy. So I ran away from school and came here March of 1901 to the Indian Territory. That mm -hmm. was about six years before statehood. How old were you, sir? 16 years old. Kind of young to leave home, wasn't it? Well, it was an adventure. <laughs> You're a, a large man in stature. Uh, were you a big boy? Yes, I'm six foot five inches, weigh 250 pounds, but when I came here, I was almost or about six foot, weighed about 180 or 90 pounds. Mm -hmm. What did you do when you first came here? I know you said you wanted to be a cowboy. and Well, I came in there where the town of Bristow is now, and there's a ranch known as the Burr Cook or Twin Mounds Ranch. Mm -hmm. And uh, I worked for the for this man Cook, Burr Cook. And later I worked up where the town of Drumright is now, before it was a town, uh, known as the Turkey Track Ranch. Mm -hmm. I worked there. And my first experience in Oklahoma was on ranches. In those days, uh, they'd just go out and fence so much land, or they'd squat in a certain locality with a bunch of cattle and herd them and up and down the creeks and valleys, there's no fences and no nothing. You could just run them wherever you cared to. Same way when you gather your food in the fall for cattle, they just go out and cut this prairie hay out in the prairies wherever they wanted to and haul it away. Mm -hmm. It must have been an exciting uh, young manhood that you it lived. It was quite an experience for me and I worked on Bill DePew's ranch who was a deputy United States, who was the United States Marshal. And uh, I took a liking to him, and he took a liking to me, and he commissioned me when I was 18 years old as a deputy United States Marshal for the, for the Indian Territory. Mm -hmm. There was an Indian Territory, as you understand Oklahoma history, and an Oklahoma Territory. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was in the Indian Territory, later came into the Oklahoma Territory. Was that after uh, any of the troubles and so forth, uh, Indian troubles? 
There was no Indian troubles that I knew of involved at that time. Oh. There later was some Indian trouble, the Crazy Snake Rebellion. You probably know yes, about sir. 1916, but that was long after this, you know. Mm -hmm. There's no trouble with the Indians at that time. Uh, imagine those experiences, however, as the uh, deputy marshal were exciting to a degree. Well, there wasn't much work to do, very little, very little. There'd be some fugitive get away and come into the community and and we'd have to ferret him out or uh, someone would uh, go on to Indian land and take where there was valuable timber, mm -hmm. such as walnut and stuff like that. They'd cut off of Indian land and there'd be certain complaints and arrests made in that connection. There wasn't very many people here. There wasn't too many, too many crimes. There wasn't too many people to commit the crimes. Mm -hmm. I was going to uh, mention that the popular idiom of today have ma has made heroes out of many people back in those days as the real bad men. Did you ever run into them? Well, I don't know that I have. I've had some experience in those days, but I don't know whether it's worthy of mention or not because I was only along with a group. You're right. Uh -huh. I was along with a group. What did you move into then, after your tenure as a uh, deputy Well, marshal? I, while working on Bill DePew's ranch, who was the, the United States Marshal, I became acquainted with a young girl whose father was the head of the Indian uh, tribe, the Sac and Fox Indian. And, uh, he had charge of them by looking after them. I believe they called him the Indian farmer in those days, as I recall. He looked after them and taught them how to farm or try to farm and looked after their general welfare. Mm -hmm. And uh, I met his daughter by reason of being associated with the marshal and, and the ranch is all in the Indian territory there. And I fell in love with his daughter and married her. And I was. 20 years old, and she was uh, almost 18. We've been married, we'll be 60 years the 1st of May. Hmm. And when did you move into Oklahoma City? Well, prior to that, yes. I moved into Oklahoma City in 1912, uh, 11 or 12, I believe it was. Mm -hmm. But prior to that time, uh, if I might say this, that I was always interested in not only the law enforcement, but in the law generally. And uh, in the Indian, Indian township was uh, two townships rather than one, but was included in so far as the, the voting area was concerned as a township. It covered two townships uh, in area. And we had an election in 1907, and uh, having been or was, the deputy United States Marshal, they ran me on the ticket for constable in Indian Township where I'd been for many years there, several years with the Indians and uh, as deputy, deputy United States Marshal. And they ran a fellow that I can't remember now his name for just a piece. Mm -hmm. And when he was elected, when we were elected, all of us, I was elected and he was elected in 1907. Uh, he couldn't qualify because he couldn't read or write, <laughs> but he was a pretty nice fella and could uh, uh, handle the constable end of it. So with the county commissioners, we switched, and I took over the JP job, and he took my job as constable. <laughs> and I served there until uh, from 1907 until about 1910, and I left and went to Kansas City, started to go into law school with the police department in Kansas City, and. I backed the wrong man for mayor, and I was fired. I came to Oklahoma City then, and and uh, I've been here since 19 and early part of 1912. Well, actually, that uh, liking for law and the inquisitive mind for the workings of the law has been uh, predominant in your life all the way always, through. Always, always, always. My father wanted me to study for the ministry, but I always wanted to be a, my my ambition was to be a lawyer. So I came to Oklahoma City, they had a night law school, which now has developed into one of our great schools. And mm -hmm. I, there's only about four or five uh, that was in the class with me. One of them is Mont Powell out here at the Capitol, you probably know. Yes, sir. Uh -huh. Mont was in the class with me, and, and I finished school in 1915. 
here in Oklahoma City and was admitted to practice law. Well, what school was that? The Knight Oklahoma City School of Law. Well, the Oklahoma City School Oklahoma, of Law. Oklahoma, the one they have here now. Mm -hmm. It was in the Carl Court building. They had their, their school was in the Carl Court building. One of the teachers was Charlie West, who was Attorney General, a very great man. And Prince Freeling was one of the teachers, a very great lawyer. C.B. Stewart, they've all passed on now. And then since I was admitted, I've been practicing here ever since. You certainly have. You've had quite a career, Mr. Cargo. About 50 years. 50 years of actual practice. A long time. And actively engaged for in that practice for many well, years. Well, when you got out of law school, uh, did you go out for yourself, or did you get with a firm, or uh, No, and I, was, I stayed with the police department for a while. I was afraid to quit an $80 a month job. I was afraid I would starve to death. Uh -huh. But I ran into a lawsuit that someone wanted me to handle, and I turned in my badge and credentials and went to practice the law. And and uh, uh, I think about, let's uh, see, that would be about 16 and 1918, I, I backed a man by the name of Robert Burns for county attorney here. And uh, he was later our lieutenant governor, a senator from this district, later lieutenant governor. He is now deceased. And I backed him for county attorney, and he was elected, and I was made his first assistant. He was only in there a little while. He didn't like it for some reason, and he resigned, and the commissioners appointed me, and I served his term as county attorney of this county in 1918-19, mm -hmm. I believe. And later, I went back to the practice of law with Ned Looney. Ned Looney and I were law partners. So in 1923, I was elected mayor of Oklahoma City in uh, March of 1923. Served four years. That is before the managerial form of government. Then it was an actual working job continually all the well, time. Yes, full-time job and a full salary. I don't remember what it was, but it was, I thought, a terrific salary, probably three or four hundred dollars a month. Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh, that's all right. Have him come in. Yeah. You've yeah. known Don Green? Sure. Well, I happened to get away in time so I could get here, and uh, it was fine, so I wouldn't hold up uh, Mr. Cargo. Well, that, uh, I imagine that uh, four years as the mayor of Oklahoma City back in those days, uh, that was quite a chore, wasn't it? Well, it's, it kept you busy. Mm -hmm. It had the full responsibility of the police department, law enforcement, mm -hmm. and uh, you were more or less in a supervisory capacity over all departments. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to think now. I believe there was four commissioners. I'm sure I'm right. There was four commissioners. They were elected from the four wards, and then I was then I was elected mayor of the whole city from, from all the wards. Yeah. and of course uh, we had uh, quite a lot of responsibility. The mayor in those days bought all, everything that was purchased for the all the departments, and uh, was responsible for the purchase of it. He was responsible for the enforcement of the law and uh, the appointment of the judiciary and looking after that and the police department. The whole whole system, you had to look after it. It was quite a chore. Well, your uh, experience in the law department itself or the law enforcement department should have helped somewhat. Well, it is, of course, a great help to me, great help to me. I bet you ran into some characters during these early days of Oklahoma City, didn't you? Uh, colorful people. Well, uh, I would say yes. I'm trying to think, not having an opportunity beforehand to uh -huh. study uh, characters of that nature or that you have mentioned. Uh, I would know hardly where to commence. I, <laughs> of course, I knew old Al Jennings personally, if, and I don't know whether you remember him or not. As Who was Al Jennings? Famous train robber, you know. He uh -huh. was a lawyer turned train robber here in Oklahoma. Became an international character. Right and uh, finally got paroled and come almost being elected governor of this state. <laughs> That's a twist, isn't it? It is, and then he went to California and went in the movies and had him a, uh, an organization of his own making pictures there. Mm -hmm. Lived to be 96, I visited him two years ago at his ranch in California, 96 years old. Was he pretty active still at that Very age? active, very active. This area seemed to have spawned a lot of uh, 
uh, not only longevity, but the activity in people. Yes, but uh, the, the thing that has always impressed me more, so far as I'm personally concerned, I was always interested in men that were trying to do something for Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. We had great characters here, such as C.B. Stewart, one of the great lawyers, one of the great jurists, old uh, Barrett Heiner was another great one, and old Judge Cockrell, and uh, we had, uh, of course, we'd come in contact with some fellows like Mormon Pruitt. He was, he was a great lawyer, yet he only handled criminal matters, but he was a great lawyer and, and a great man. And uh, the Giddings boys that was here, and uh, they, uh, then you take uh, C.B. Ames, who was one of the great lawyers. His, he was the father of, of the Fisher Ames that's here now as a lawyer. He was one of the great lawyers. And uh, Judge Richardson, there's just a number of them, very, very fine lawyers. And they were uh, models, or I, uh, they, uh, I more or less idolized them because I thought they were great men, and they were great men, and I loved their association. They were very kind and considerate to me, even when I was studying law. They were furnished me lots of very valuable material, and, and I considered their assistance and their help more than anything I ever come in contact with. When they'd try lawsuits, I'd go to the courtroom and watch them in their mannerism and how they would handle lawsuits and how they would approach it and the questions of great importance and how they would argue cases. And, and it was to me the, a great help. And I found that my association with men such as they were, like in other, in other words, I've more or less been associated with all the governors, got acquainted with them, I have observed every governor that has sworn in since statehood except the last one. I was when Haskell was sworn in at Guthrie. I, I attended the Constitutional Convention as a young man and uh, met all those fellows like Bill Murray, who I considered one of my very closest friends, old Henry Johnson, who Henry opposed me or I opposed him in the governor's race in 26. And he, of course, he defeated me. He was a Ku Klux Klan candidate although I don't think it made any difference to Henry, as I think he was a good man. He was involved in some impeachment trouble, but he, I think he's a good man. I always considered him a good man. It's always my friend. Politics has been rather hectic through Oklahoma, hasn't it? Through always the history. been, I'd say hectic, yes, mm -hmm. in that the Democrats were in the majority and they fought each other <laughs> you might say to the extreme sometime. And More so than fighting the Republicans. Yeah, well, there was no Republicans, so you might say, to fight. We were <laughs> in such a, so nowadays, now we've got it to where it's a, a little different, to where there is some uh, recognition of the Republicans because they're making inroads all the time. Mm -hmm. I don't know how much that, uh, when it would come to a contest, a real contest, what it would be, but they have made numerous inroads. In the other, uh, some of the other interviews that we've had, Mr. Cargo, we've gotten around to the subject of how this city has progressed, uh, physically how it's progressed, and uh, some of the people who've contributed to that progression. Well, of course, you'd have to go back and pick up men like Mr. Calcord whom I've known most intimately. He's one of the great men that helped me when I was a struggling boy. And this bit of art that you see here on this desk mm -hmm. came from Italy. It was given to me by Carl Cord. It's one of the finest pieces of, of uh, art that you, you've ever looked at. That's cut out of marble. And uh, it's in the way of 50 or 60 pounds. It doesn't look like it, but mm -hmm. it's a fine piece of marble. And he was, he was my dear friend. He helped me very much. And, he was one of the founders. The other was old man Anton Klassen, who uh, helped to lay out this town here, was a very close friend of mine. And Bill Hales, who built this building, W.T. Hales, was a very fine man. And uh, they, 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 and uh, uh, w. Bill Petty, who used to be the Petty Hardware, and Bill Skirvin, the Skirvin, I knew all of them most intimately. Old Huckins, old Joe Huckins that built the Huckins Hotel. I knew all of those fellows. And uh, I hope I don't leave out anyone that ought to be mentioned because I knew all of them. 
And there were fellows that, uh, I'm not saying that there's any unselfishness now in our Chamber of Commerce or in our businessmen, but they were the most unselfish group of men I ever knew. They have nothing considered in the way of politics. Bill Petty was a Republican, Bill Hale's a Republican, and Carl Cord is a Republican, and I'm sure uh, Antone Class is a Republican, old uh, Chartel. Mm -hmm. was, uh, they, most of them, but they didn't, they, there, was no, there was no politics involved when it come to the betterment of Oklahoma City. They really went out and got things done, and I'm not saying we're not doing it now, but there is this fight between the city council and the, and the chamber of commerce and, mm -hmm. and the, 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 the factional differences. We really didn't have it in those days. Everybody seemed to try to do the thing that was best for Oklahoma City. And I think that's one of the things that caused it to grow like it has grown. It, it, it's, moved all, it's moved progressively ever since I've been here, and I've been here quite a little while. Uh, what would cause men like that to be so... Um, uh, well, they disregard their own interests, so to speak, to, to go all out. Were they in a position that they didn't have to worry too much about their livelihood? Well... Uh, I, know I, I wouldn't know hard. Uh, uh, I'd say a lot of it is jealousy. Mm -hmm. In other words, uh, now there's another great man that I forgot is Ed Overholzer. I mm -hmm. knew his father, old Henry Overholzer, mm -hmm. and it built the Overholzer Theater. And I've seen Warner. They're turning it down now. I understand. I've been around over there, and I, he was another great leader. And he was also a Republican. Mm -hmm. I think Ed Vaught. I knew Ed Vaught when he was school teacher. He was superintendent of schools here, you know, and became our chief judge of the federal court here for many years, a very great man. And But uh, but I say you ask me what these things come about, about the, the factional differences. If it's not politics, in my opinion, it's uh, trying to defeat the other fellow for some personal reason. Mm -hmm. That's the way I look at it, some personal reason. And I think that when we're dealing with public affairs and things that are for the betterment of Oklahoma City, that ought not to be involved. Politics should not be involved in it. Well, so Oklahoma City has a good track record. There's no question about it, as far as their progression is concerned. I think so. I think and, so. Uh, the men and the, the women, too, that helped yeah. put it on the right track. Yes, I, I agree that there are. That we've had some great men that's helped along all the time. What took place of any particular importance that you can recall? during your tenure as mayor? Well, I'd say the, <coughs> the thing that was two things. First of all, was the, we had a flood here, one of the great floods. We never had one before or since like it. Mm -hmm. And they had what we call the Overholzer Lake out here that was constructed originally of dirt. And when we had that flood, it washed that out, turned that all that lake into Oklahoma City, changed the river channels down here all through town, washed away all the buildings down here in south and Reno and in that country. The water's come way up here, almost up to town. I had that to contend with. The city was out of water, and we arranged to build a little coffer dam up at the back end there and, and hold the canal for water until we could build it. And under my administration, we built the present steel structure you see out there that you can when the floods come, you can lift the water and let the water escape to take care of the overflow water that's coming down. And that was designed and built under my administration. There was no uh, way of getting to Capitol Hill except down through the bottom over here, through the port it like you would a creek, right straight down Robinson. And after the flood, the channel of the river had changed and left a bridge isolated and made it worse to get across. The river used to run right next to the Superior feed mills over here. That's where the river was until 1923. And then it's cut straight across. I left that bridge sitting over there. <clears throat> then I went to work and, uh, under my administration, built this Walker Street viaduct between here and Capitol Hill, here on Walker Street. That was mm -hmm. constructed. And I also built the, uh, this, the our sewage disposal. We didn't have anything. Just dumped it in the North Canadian River prior to that time, and that was constructed under my administration. Then the worst thing that could happen, we had uh, uh, 
well, I don't know what you'd call it when Jack Walton was elected mayor or governor, uh, they had some controversy and he declared martial law. Put the city under martial law and we had put everything under martial law right at about fair time. We had quite a quite a time of getting that straightened out, but eventually did by and through the help of these leaders that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. We had to make certain concessions and certain things in order to keep the fair open and to keep it going. Those are the high points, I would say, of things that I remember from that experience as mayor. Mm -hmm. Mr. Mayor, the, uh, uh, the control of the North Canadian River to keep it from flooding again, I imagine, is quite a story in itself, isn't it? Uh, that was done later. I had nothing to do with that. That's that the straightening of the river and and the rip rapids you see there now on the chain. That it's the new channel. See, the old waterworks used to be up here where the city water filtration plant is. Mm -hmm. There used to be a dam there, and that's where the dam was there that uh, that uh, that contained our water. It back clear up to and into where the fairgrounds is now. That was a deep canal. It was, didn't flood out. It just a deep canal. The river was deep in those days and not flat as you see it today. The erosion hadn't occurred so bad on farmland, so it filled it up. During the uh, time that you were ma mayor, you had to spend most of your time as the... All the time. It is a, it is a full-time job. Full-time. Full -time full -time then you uh, went back into private law practice, went Back right? into private law practice, yes. With whom? Ned Looney. Ned Looney, and how long? Uh, Ned and oh, Ned and I did not go back. I, uh, Ned and I were law partners from 18 until 26. Mm -hmm. And before I went out as mayor, my boys was coming on, and Ned and I discussed it, and he went. He had a desire to represent uh, railroads and insurance companies and, and public utilities. Mm -hmm. And my uh, association with the labor movement always I had been uh, connected with the labor movement, and uh, I decided I would represent the individual, and I didn't want to represent any any corporations. I've never had a retainer. Don't have a retainer now. I have an office expense of about six thousand a month, and don't have a single retainer, not a one. I never have had. Mine has been that of an independent trial lawyer handling any litigation that comes about, regardless of what it is, we try to handle it. And by that way, we're our own boss. We don't, we no obligations to nobody. I can sue whoever I want to. <laughs> uh, a lot of times I don't like to, but nevertheless, it's my business. We have to do that, and that's, that's been my, so I've, I've, I've been on this side of the table, and Mr. Looney's been on the other, but we remain most intimate friends all the time. Is Very Mr. Looney still alive? Yes. He has his birthday yesterday. He's 11 months younger than I am. <laughs> and uh, we're having a, I'm giving a party. I do each year at the Skirvin to about 80 of my folks and his folks. And we have a big birthday party, and we're going to have it the 21st, which is Sunday week mm -hmm. at the Skirvin with about 80 to 100 people. I've got something like 35 of mine, you see, individually. I have three children now, and I'd, my daughter was, my oldest daughter was killed in an auto accident four years ago, and then I have uh, three children, ten grandchildren, and sixteen great grandchildren. That's quite a group when you get them together. Yes, sir. And, so and my brothers and sisters, I have a number. Of, a number of my brothers and sisters live here in Oklahoma, in Oklahoma County, and so we have a meeting every year. I have a birthday party for them. I mean, after they uh, after they got over the shock of the fact that this 16-year-old came out to Oklahoma to be a cowboy, they decided to move out here, some of them also? Yes. My father in 1907, when, when that opened up the Indian Territory over there in the Sack and Fox country so farmers could come in, we were primarily agricultural in those days, mm -hmm. wasn't anything else. So my father had a mercantile establishment as well as his doctor's office in a little town in Arkansas where we lived, Viola. So he moved his mercantile establishment to, to a place and, uh, that adjoined the offices of my father-in-law who had charge of the Indians. And father put in the store and built him an office there and he sold merchandise. And then I went in partners with my dad in the, in the mercantile business. And, mm -hmm. and uh, 
and uh, he practiced medicine, and we had where we could, they'd trade while we could all us get our money by uh, let them have it on a credit to end and when they'd get their pay, it'd come through my father-in-law, so we didn't lose anything. <laughs> <laughs> you had a box there, there. Well, we had a pretty good deal. Father yeah. was a doctor, and, uh, and uh, I'd try to sell him <coughs> merchandise because I spoke the Stack and Fox language pretty good, and, and it was great help to us when you were selling merchandise or whatever it was. And, oh. You could, uh, we had anything that they wanted in the way of harness, from groceries to harness. That's the way to put it, buggies or anything they wanted. Mm -hmm. Then in 1907, 19, and, uh, uh, right after we went into business, about a year and a half, we had a, what they call now a depression. But we called it in those days a panic. <laughs> and everything went to pot. And when I, that's, that, that was a blessing in disguise because I'd wanted them to get in the law business and I sold everything I had to pay my obligations and went to Kansas City and got with a streetcar company as a streetcar conductor. And by the way, I used to run the, the Independence Center Urban from, from Kansas City to Independence and became acquainted with old Harry Truman, whom I've known since 1910. What was he doing at that time? He was working in a store. He worked down there in town in the store, and he later put in one of his own. Oh, that haberdasher. Yeah, yeah but he was just a clerk, I believe, in Emory Bird and Fair, as I remember it. Uh-huh. I mean, he's on that car every evening and morning. I, I knew him quite well. <laughs> and I, but I, my wife and I visited him since he came out of the presidency. Mm -hmm. there. He's a very nice fellow to know. Very I had, nice. I had the pleasure of meeting him some years ago on very four nice. occasions. Uh, and as a member of the press corps, I know he was very, always very cordial to us. Very nice, very nice. Very uh, he nice. may not have liked some of the things that we wrote or That's said, right. but then he would say so too. Yeah, he'd tell you. He had no, he, no compunction about uh, telling you precisely how he felt about you. He was quite a character. He was well, and I like very much. Well, actually, uh, history has already recorded, and will even more so, some of his accomplishments as president. He'd done the best he could. Mm -hmm. I think he'd done the best he could. Mm -hmm. Because all of us make mistakes. I don't care who we are, we make mistakes. Well, we're just mortal human beings. Pardon? We're just mortal human beings. That's correct. That's correct. We're mortal human beings. Mr. Cargill, in your law business in, in those early days, do you recall any uh, uh, case or cases that really stand out in your own mind in which you were uh, engaged? Well, my first practice of law was in the criminal division. Mm -hmm. That's one of the reasons Mr. Looney didn't like the criminal work as well as I did. I've tried 198 people for murder in my experience. Mm -hmm. And uh, most of them was during the first 20 years mm -hmm. of my practice. And uh, I've had some very interesting lawsuits, very interesting lawsuits. I wrote a book Oh, some 30 years ago concerning a lawsuit that I wrote called Fratricide, where a brother kills a brother. Mm -hmm. And uh, this man was head of the news, he owned the newspaper at, uh, at Bartlesville. And his brother was, became intimate with his wife, younger brother. Mm -hmm. Long story. But uh, he came down here, his wife left him and went someplace, he came down here presumably to kill his brother because his brother had been a, was charged with some offense. And uh, the paper stated he would, there were officers who were going to Muskogee to get him, bring him back here for trial. Mm -hmm. He went down here and bought him a pistol and was on the Katy Depot platform when his brother got off the train between two officers and handcuffed. He walked up and shot him and killed him, shot him five times and killed him. I tried him and cleared him. I think that's almost an impossible lawsuit, but I did it. And there's a record of it down here at the courthouse. Uh, you clear on what basis? Insanity. And I, I mean, let me let me tell you that that was that was real. You can build those things up for a man just gets full if he loves a woman, and and that's involved in the lawsuit. Mm -hmm. There's more murders committed over a woman and nearly anything else, or over a man, one or the other. And uh, when you take a fellow that was so devoted to his wife and three children as that man was, devoted to them, I'll never forget that when he called for me to come to the jail, while he was pacing up and down the inside the bars, outside the cell, 
with one of these stand-up collars with a big bow tie, you know, and mm -hmm. a big black hat on, yes, a frock tail coat. Uh, he's, re he's ready to go someplace. Mm -hmm. And I, he began to talk to me, and I said to him, I said, well, you're in pretty serious trouble, in my opinion. And here's what he said. He said, that's a matter of supreme indifference to me. I just want you to represent me. <laughs> that's exactly his expression. Well, I tried the case to make a long story short now, in case you're talking about it. There's many of them, that, mm -hmm. but that stands out. When we were trying the case, we finally got a hold of the wife, and she'd come back here from someplace. The children came to their father immediately, and they were intelligent, fine-looking children, two boys and a girl, mm -hmm. about 18 to 20 years old. They made excellent witnesses. She finally took the stand herself and testified in his behalf, laid the whole thing bare. And while we we're, while we were trying that case, and when I was arguing the case, I, I asked her, I said to her, I said, this man is deeply in love with you and has always been. If he'd forgive you, would you forgive him? And she said, I'd be happy to do that. And I asked him about it, and he said, yes. I said, if the jury turns you loose, will you marry this woman? He said, you would. When the court from the jury verdict come in, and they're not guilty, the same judge that tried the case, and the jurors are all a witness, we got a certificate and married him before the same judge. You never saw anything like it in your Before life. they left the courtroom. Before huh? they left the courtroom and those children were just shouting with joy. And I've never seen or heard from that man or his family from that day to this. I that's that's an odd thing, isn't I it? I never don't know what become of them at all. And I wrote a book on it. I used different characters than his name, of course. Mm -hmm. It was an interesting thing. I, sh I should judge it would be. It would be interesting to read that book. Well, I'll get you one. I'll get one and give it to you. I, they might be, there might be a, some volumes of them around here. I've written a number of books. I'm not bragging, but then I've written a number of books, as you probably don't know anything about. Well, a man with your varied experiences, particularly dealing with the law, should have had sufficient experience that's, to... That's the only one that I wrote that had anything to do with my profession. With the profession? Mm -hmm. What have your other books been on? Well, I wrote a book on, I used to like to write prose. Yes. And they say it takes a crazy man to write that, but I'd have my experiences in courtroom with various sundry clients and experiences, right. and I would write a little bit about that, don't you see? Uh -huh. Walter Harrison, who used to be with the Daily Oklahoma, read lots of my stuff over the radio. And right. Incidentally, a couple of years ago, my children wanted to, some of those volumes, and they had, book had them reproduced and I've got some here and I'll give you one before I leave it I've got one of those and I can get you one of the fratricide then I wrote uh, the book of uh, I've only got one of those I wrote the book some two or three years ago three or four years ago uh, the title of it is Jesus the Messiah I never lost my contact through my father with my religious training mm -hmm. And I went to Moody Institute after I was 60 years old and took the course in theology and Christian uh, and Christian theology and history of the Bible. And uh, in connection with that, I wrote this book that gives all the prophecies of the coming of the Messiah and all the, all the fulfillments. There it is. And uh, I only have that volume. That they just went like hot. And I never, I just uh, have them there. And Mr. Cargill, you've been a busy man. Well, I, and then when my poor daughter passed away, I was, of course, shocked like any father would be. She was run over and killed by an automobile, mm -hmm. right in the prime of life and health. I wrote a little book that I treasure very much. If a man dies, shall he live again? I hope to meet her someday. Then when we have finished this, I'll give you one of those books that I wrote in 32 that Walter Harrison talked so much about. And I'll give you boys each one of those before you leave. Now, except the one over here. I don't have a copy of that. That's, uh, that's wonderful. I'll give you one of those. Then I wrote a book last year in which I was very much interested in from the standpoint of the difference between a spiritual Christian and a carnal Christian. Mm -hmm. And I wrote a book on that. I do this work at home. I find this thing to be very helpful. 
think it is to anyone, that if you let the work here at the office and the problems of your lawsuit or Joe Dokes's lawsuit go home with you, you it's going to hurt you. You just can't sleep. You just try that lawsuit all night long. So I have developed in my studies, built me up quite a library, the studies of the Bible, characters of the Bible, things I want to know about the Bible. And I divorce myself from my law business when I get home. And I find that it gives me great comfort in studying those uh, commentaries and, and, uh, and histories of the Bible as well as the Bible itself. I find it a great relief from this work here and a great stimulant to me. And that's why I've written these books. Get you away from your work. Plus the fact that you, uh, you spend a great deal of time outside, don't you? Yes, I do. All the time. I'm mm -hmm. an outside man. I'm out when I, when I raised stock, I was always, I've always had a farm as long as soon as I was able to buy one. And I stay on, I've been on the farm now since 33. Is that the farm you have now? No. Uh, the farm that I, uh, I bought and moved on to in 33, I sold it to Harper Turner. When the oil fields hit in the West Edmund field, I had some land out there and I had quite a nice home. And uh, they wanted it and I sold them that land and they used it for an office, the oil people did, the home I had out there during the boom of the oil field. I had other land out there and that's where I live now, mm -hmm. on where I have my present ranch is land that I've owned for 30, 35 years. That's a fine ranch you have now. It's a nice place. About how many acres? I've got 320 acres under chain link fence, with, but then I, we have some other properties besides that, but then that's my main place there that, where I keep my stock there at home. And that's where you live. I live there. And that's where you keep that fine looking horse that you throw a leg over every morning, huh? That's where I keep my horse and ride him every day. What got you into uh, uh, this uh, buffalo? Well, that's that's some very interesting things. I hadn't thought of that, but I represented both the 101 Ranch and the uh, Pawnee Bill Ranch, and there since 1916, when our first my first client was was Pawnee Bill, and later I and the old man that owned the ranch at Mulhall. What was his name? Old oh, Jack Mulhall. Mm -hmm. And uh, I represented those fellows off and on all, nearly all the time, up until his death. So when I went up to uh, draw the will for uh, uh, Pawnee Bill, he wanted me to take his buffalo. And of course, I didn't, at that time, didn't want him. I had no place to keep him, and uh -huh. there's only seven or eight, or maybe 10. So I said, I agreed very graciously that I would take them and appreciate it very much. Well, so I, I started with them, and after I, started with them. I've learned to love them. I'd rather raise them than anything that I have ever had any experience in trying to raise. And I have about 75 head now. I sell them all the time, but I keep them 50 to 100 head all the time. Oh, how did you get so interested in them as opposed to some other type of animal? Well, uh, they are the most devoted animal in the world. They're like a dog. I never heard that before. They are. That they're they're to you you're a total stranger to them right they might do something to you mm -hmm. but I can go out in the pasture to do some kind of work around the dam or with my hired man to go out there and we start to do some work out there whatever it is they'll all come up and they'll all lay down all around close to where you are till you get through and go home they'll all stay right with you they won't even leave you till they till you go back mm -hmm. most of them the older ones that I've got some young ones now that my age has permitted me to go out and mix with them like I used to. Mm -hmm. But I've got some now that I've raised that when they, when they see me come out there, they come right up to me and lick your hand and I can feed them out of them. All this carry, they, they, they go by smell more than sight. If you drive up in an automobile, they'll go up to the automobile and they'll shout at the automobile. I can speak to them and stick my hand out and they'll come up and smell of it. And mm. I can get right out and pet them. I can put my arm around their neck just like you would a child. Mm really can. It's amazing. I've never heard that description of buffalo before as to their they're, reactions. They're absolutely, they're, they're just like, they're as faithful as a dog, but you, they're, 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 they can't be trusted though. When they get excited, that they're, they're not excited. They get excited, they just, you know, they go to pieces, but I've never been bothered by one of them. And I go right, right out through them, just as close to them as 
could be. They don't bother me at well, all. Well, did you learn that, or did you pick that up from someone? Uh, no, I learned it just by handling of them. That's right. Just, just by handling By association. Yeah. By my association with them. They're very, very gentle with me. Mm -hmm. Very gentle. I can put them anywhere in the world I want to. They follow me any place I want them to go. Do you have any trouble with them breeding in so much in so-called captivity? You might say. No, that <coughs> the, the, if you leave a calf with the cow, mm -hmm. she won't breed every year. She'll keep that calf that she yearling. She'll carry it over. Mm -hmm. Because I take it that nature so provided that it might be bad winter or something, and the mother can provide milk enough to keep it. Mm -hmm. I'd say that was it. But where my experience with it is that when the calf gets about four months old, if you take the calf off of it her and put it on calf feed and put it in a lot. She'll breed back immediately and have a calf every year. I can have a calf from a buffalo cow every year, or I can have it every other year, just whichever I uh -huh. choose. Who do you sell them to, Mr. Carter? Oh, I sold a man the, the Davis Wholesale Company in Jacksonville, Florida. I sold him 17 head, a bull, and 16 head, a bull, and 15 cows. I sold to Crestview, Florida, Ten head. I sold a Ford dealer in Cleveland, Ohio. Eleven head. I sold this Hewlett outfit over here. They got the ranch up in Mosage, Ten Fog, and his name sent him everywhere. Well, so what do they do? They raise them. They raise them, and uh, and this man in Cleveland told me he had now sixty head out of eleven. I sold him five years ago. Hmm. I told him how to wean the calves and produce them, and he sends me pictures. He's got a nice. They, if you ever start to raise them, you'll never quit it. Then we use them for meat. Right. I butcher them for the Cowboy Hall of Fame. And I, I butchered two for the Junior Chamber of Commerce International. They had that here. And I butcher them for all the sundry people that want buffalo for parties. Well, I've been fortunate enough to have some. You've of been that. out there. They certainly have, and that's delicious. Yeah. It's absolutely delicious. Yeah. We do that for people that we want people to People are amazed the fact that that meat is not tough. No. Oh. It's tender. No, I don't, well, here's what here's the reason of that. If you buy a buffalo years ago for a barbecue, you'll kill an old cow or an old tough bull that you couldn't cut it with an axe. Uh -huh. I never butcher anything over two years old. Uh -huh. And it's all this young stuff that we keep in good shape and keep it so that its meat's delicious and good. Usually yearlings I kill, uh -huh. and they're always nice. Oh, I imagine you uh, uh, add to their diet. Oh yes, we feed them. We feed them superior feed and alfalfa hay and all winter long, and, or whatever. We keep them in good shape all the time, so they're abundant to be butchered. Well, Young, their ancestors never had it so good. No, they never had it so good. We we keep plenty of grass, as you can see. There's worlds of grass yeah. there, and uh, we we take care of them, keep them in good shape. Well, you have some other animals out there too. Well, I've got a bunch of elk and some mm -hmm. Chinese deer, those white ones, and some Japanese deer, and then they're regular deer. They, we keep that stuff there. I know I have a six-year-old boy that I took him out there one Sunday just to drive by. Well, why didn't you Because he wanted in? to see it, and uh, he just he couldn't get him away from that fence. Well, why don't you come up to the house? I'll take you out in the pasture and show you what they'll do to mm -hmm. me when I go out there, and you can take pictures all you want. Edgar Bell had some pictures made of his grandchildren. Mm -hmm. I think I've got some here. Most interesting thing you ever saw. Uh, kids out there, they never forget it, you know, the, the little grandson. I thought I had it here. I saw it well, children uh, have no fear of animals. No. Like that, and they love to be near them. I've got a picture of, I uh, did have one. I don't suppose I've got it here. I don't. Where uh, my, that's old, uh, that's old craft to the Kraft Cheese Company right there. Petting the calf I had tied up to a tree. <laughs> <laughs> that's old. That's that's uh, oh, uh, Jeff Kraft, the Kraft Cheese Company of Chicago. He was a great friend of mine. He come down here and and uh, gets back to nature a little bit. Huh? huh? Gets back to nature a little bit. Yeah. I don't know what that, but that doesn't matter. But it'd be interesting to look at it again. But that's old. I well, your place out there has become quite a quite a popular spot. And you have been, I know, very gracious in extending uh, courtesy to, like, the International Junior Chamber yeah. and also to the Chamber of Commerce here and other groups that... Uh, well, I'm glad to do it. 
I'm just glad to do it. If I get a, I get a joy out of it. I like people. Mm. And I like to have them out there. And, and if they're having a good time, I can have a good time too. I enjoy it. You draw any comparisons? I know you have between uh, some of those old days, which were pretty rugged and rather hectic as to the days around now as to what do you think we're all going to end up? That's a broad statement to make in a question. Well, <coughs> my opinion is that people are better today than they were in the early day. I mean, from the standpoint of, of really, from morality, let's put it that way. Mm -hmm. I think that we, the reason why we have a lot of crime that we refer to, we just have more people. We had less crime in those days because we had less people. There are criminals in every age and every stage of civilization. There are just going to be a lot of people are criminal by reason of disease. They're just born wrong. But uh, a lot of it is because of youth that comes up nowadays that our trouble today is that a boy can't go out at 16 years old like I did, go out into a vast country where there was millions of acres that uh, unturned, Mm -hmm. The whole world in front of him. He, and when you go by a man's house, just tell him you want to stay all night. You can stay a week if you wanted to. You just said, but now you'd run him off with a shotgun because you'd say he's a thief, or there's a tramp, or a bum. I could have been shot for a bum a many a time, going about the country well, for miles. For you could find a house, but you was always welcome. Mm -hmm. you, there, 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 there was no selfishness today. We have too much of me, you know, on my mind. We don't have uh, that broad sense of brotherly love or our expressions and desires to help the other fellow. We don't want to do that. If you can tear him down, if he's way up the top of the ladder and he's done something you don't like and I'm in a position to destroy him, we'll just eliminate him. Mm -hmm. Well, I, that, that's, not, that's not the principle of civilization at all. But so far as crime is concerned, I don't... I don't think our children are any worse today than they were then. Their opportunities are not as good. And maybe we don't give them the same care that my father and yours, or at least my father, gave to me. Because he, I, I, we had an old blackboard with a fireplace and a log house. We worked our problems together. Mm -hmm. and, and, we, and we studied our books together. And there was ten of us children. And, and we all worked together. And we, we, tried to, we tried to get our lessons. Nowadays, it's... Uh, I'm saying it my own because too much we depend on too much of the babysitter and too much of the governess and too much of, of the maid and too much of the school teacher and less of mom and dad. I don't think the children's any different. I think they're just the same. And I think we're fortunate in having as many good kids as we do have. I have no quarrel with the children at all. Well, uh, an acquaintance of mine and been in the business for many years and he's quite a flamboyant character but still underneath it all quite a man jackie gleason yes I, he said and you probably know jackie you've met i him. watch him ever i've been i was just placed two weeks ago mm -hmm. in miami i was in puerto rico in january to a bar meeting and i come back through there and stopped and went over to see him you know him much better than I. Well, I've I just, just met, met him on a few he's occasions he's a nice to tell he made a statement the next time you see him mr cargill uh, uh, that statement he made has made the greatest impression upon me. He was uh, Someone asked him a question about juvenile delinquency. He said, it isn't necessarily juvenile delinquency. Or what's the trouble with these young people today, the teenagers? It's mental unemployment That's right. with the young people. That's right. He said, it isn't uh, a lack of morals. That's right. Uh, a lack of this, that, because we're, we all lack something uh, by degree as compared to other people. He said he thought the biggest reason for the up uh, surge in the anxiety of the young people today is mental unemployment. That's right. And to me, that was the greatest statement that's, that's ever been made. That's a very good statement. That's a good statement. I don't think there's any boy or girl, for that matter, boy in particular, that doesn't have an ambition and desire to do something and accomplish something for himself. And if that, if that boy has an opportunity, to have that mentality and that desire uh, to be developed. That's a great thing if we can just develop it. What's our city look like today when you look back in retrospect and what do you think of it? A lot of times, perhaps out on that horse in the morning, you may get a thought as to 
Yes, I ride that horse in the wintertime. Uh, I start out at 6.45. It's daylight now, but in the wintertime, I ride my four miles, and I'm back home before it's daylight. But my son says I ought to have a tail light. Somebody's going to run over me. <laughs> but uh, after all, I ride on that side road if you've been by my mm -hmm. place. I go a mile to east and a mile north. Mm -hmm. Back and forth, you never see anyone there, you see. And, I, right. and so uh, in riding there every morning, when I leave out, of, uh, when I go out at my front gate in the wintertime, right. uh, you can see Oklahoma City. In fact, my ranch is at 164th Street. Uh, mm -hmm. They tried to bring me into the city, but I didn't want to come in. So I'm at 164th Street, North McCarthy. That's where I am. Right. So when I ride out there every morning and look at that city and see, it, see how beautiful those lights are, it's, it's really wonderful to look at. And I believe is, uh, if nothing happens in the way of our present progress, that Oklahoma City will almost double itself in the next 10 years. I believe that. I believe it's going to really grow. Other than the norm, do you see any real roadblocks in the way of that? No, I don't. Our only trouble, our only trouble here is water. Water? Water. Well, don't you think water. we're in better shape than we were a few years ago? Yes, but I'm going to offer this bit of criticism. Mm -hmm. When I was mayor, when this dam went out over here, I had a man by the name of Hawks, an engineer, mm -hmm. and before the Grand River Dam was built, had him survey that, whereby you could have obtained that Grand River Reservoir for Oklahoma City, and you could have made it, you could run that water into Oklahoma City by gravity. Did you know that? No, it, sir. It, is, it was surveyed and you brought it down to Okima and back here. He surveyed it. I had the whole thing surveyed, but I couldn't sell it to the people. I tried my best to do it. But we could have had the Grand River Dam with all the water we'd have ever needed in the world brought into Oklahoma City without a dime expense except the laying of your pipe and bringing it here. Instead of all this terrific expense bringing water in from down here to Toka, which is a very small lake in comparison to Grand River, Mm -hmm. We'd have had ample water. That's our problem. We just, that's a where we fail. If we failed anywhere, we fail to get water. Because water, you just have to have to make a great city. We were talking with some people the other day, and they said water now is more important than the oil. It really is. It really is. And I tried to, I tried to put that over. I had one man help him, that's Frank Johnson, who was another great leader, he and his brother Hugh. You owned this bank, and Frank owned the one across the street. This was the First National, that was the American National. Two brothers, they owned the two banks. And Frank was with me on that and helped me to get Hawks and survey that. We tried to sell that to the people, but they didn't, they didn't, wouldn't go for it. It had been the greatest boon to this city of anything in the world. Is it gone now forever? Oh, yes, you can. Oh, Grand River Dam is owned by private individuals mm -hmm. now, you know. It's owned, that's where they get all that current. That electric current up in that country is made right. from Grand River, you know. That's, well, I forget the name of that public utility at Tulsa. What's the name of it? Public service. Public service. Public that's where service most comes. of their electricity comes from. Mm -hmm. That's right. Those are interesting things as you look back. But I think Oklahoma City will go right on because uh, we'll find water. We'll find water. But you may have to go a long ways for it. Still... You're going to have to go over where it's at. It isn't over this way. There's only one other place that you could get water. Well, that, that would be a local situation. There's a wonderful dam site, according to the engineers that surveyed it when we were out of water here, mm -hmm. and the dam went out. It's right west of Gary. You could build a, a dam there that would be terrific on the South Canadian. And that would come into Oklahoma City by natural flow. What we were looking for in those days was to get it in by natural flow. We didn't know the, uh, then, in those days, that you could run by siphon as they do from the river over to this lake here, you know. And that's the way it would happen when you come from Grand River down to Okima. Then it'd come from here in by uh, a siphon process, don't you see? Mm -hmm. now you've had a very interesting 80 years. Mr. Cargill. Well, it's been it's been good, and the people have been nice and good to me, and I hope and pray that it will continue that way. Because, as far as I'm personally concerned, I've I've about finished my row. 
Uh, and uh, and I'd like to, if I could, be of some help to my children and grandchildren, like any other man would be. Mm -hmm. I'm going to have to catch this phone. All right. Go right ahead. Yeah. All right. I guess you're about through with me anyway, aren't you? I, I guess we are. I think that we've covered... Uh, well, you know, I, I like to visit you. I'd visit all day long. Why, sure. No, no, that's all right. <laughs> I'd, I'd like We've, to. Uh, I told you I like people, and I like well, you, you personally, so we just visit. You do. That's the whole idea of this. <laughs> I'll get you a couple of books here. All righty. I'll give you each one of the books. Sure, thank you very much. <laughs>